This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Stick around until the end of the video to learn more about a deal they're making available through my channel. It'd be fair to say, I think, that prisoner workouts have caught the imagination of the internet. People who are thrown in the clink with no equipment, who ostensibly, you think, should be losing weight, getting skinnier. But in fact, the opposite happens. They build more muscle, strength, and performance. Not only do they manage to maintain the physiques that they had before they went in the clink, but they actually come out stronger and more aesthetic. How can this be possible? There's more to it, I think, than the simple fact that you've got nothing else to do. I think that the way that prisoners train actually taps into some really interesting functions of the body, resulting in greater strength. And of all the things I've tried, of all the different experiments I've run, I think this type of training is the closest thing I've found to a kind of untapped well of extra performance. So I've come to this old shipping container I found near me because that looks prison-y, right? No? So for example, you have Charles Bronson, the guy who looks like Dr. Robotnik. He went to jail and trained with bodyweight training. In his prime, he claimed to be able to do over 1,700 push-ups in under an hour. Then you have Mike Tyson, who went to jail and used huge rep ranges of bodyweight squats in order to develop incredibly strong legs. When he came out of jail, he maintained and even surpassed his previous physical performance, claiming that this training protocol allowed him to deliver more power in his punches. Andrew Tate, not a huge fan, but he claims that he trained predominantly prior to going to jail with bodyweight exercises, push-ups and the like. And he really touched exercises such as the bench press. Now I do believe him on that, and in spite of that, he manages to bench impressive numbers. I've seen a video of him pressing 140 kilograms. For someone only doing push-ups, Many people would assume that's impossible. And of course, when he went to jail, this explains why he didn't instantly lose his physique and in fact got bigger. But what's also interesting are the people who train like prisoners. So prisoners perform predominantly bodyweight exercises, and that means things like push-ups and pull-ups. Of course, you and I know that we can use calisthenics to massively increase the resistance on our bodies by manipulating lever lengths, by training with one arm. We can do things like planche push-ups, pseudo-planche push-ups. We can do front levers, one-armed pull-ups. There's no need to go to extremely high rep ranges. However, I guess that there being less information available for many of these people, and the fact that calisthenics is quite a niche sport, means that many of these prisoners trained with just really, really high repetition push-ups, squats, and pull-ups. And I would wager that they often used short range of motion. These are the key factors that can really tap into that additional performance. We're gonna see why in a moment. An example is Herschel Walker, who has this crazy physique and claims that he got there by just doing lots and lots of push-ups and sit-ups. The Great Gamma, a guy with an unbeaten record of a huge number of fights who could train against 40 or more opponents in a single day without burning out. There's this huge rock that weighs over 1,200 kilograms. It's called the Gamma Stone. You can still see it in a museum today. And legend has it that Gamma would train by lifting this. Again, many of these things are just legends and speculation, but when you hear enough of these stories, you start to think there must be some truth to some of it. And Gamma would train using thousands of Hindu push-ups and Hindu squats every single day. Flex Wheeler is a legendary bodybuilder from the golden era of bodybuilding who didn't use bodyweight training per se, but used high, high rep ranges of squats, but also leg press in order to develop some of the most infamous legs that were around in competition at the time. Vasily Alexiev had a weakness in his back, he had a back injury. To get around this, he reportedly would shut people out of his gym whilst he would secretly train with extremely high repetitions, really slow cadence of his modified secret version of the back hyperextension. He emerged stronger than ever and cured his back injury, and the guy has over 80 world records. Even knees over toes guy, Ben Patrick, who went from having severely damaged knees to being able to do incredible feats with them, leaping off of ladders and landing in a sissy squat position and all kinds of other stuff, dunking with ease. He got there using a variety of methods and I highly recommend checking out his ATG program, but among these were just backwards walking, step after step after step of backwards walking, light intensity, extremely high repetition, continuous time under tension, just like prisoner workouts. I just wanna throw my hat into the ring because this was my early experience of training. Like many people, I started out just doing push-ups, sit-ups and pull-ups in my bedroom, but being slightly obsessive, I would do hundreds of repetitions of push-ups by the end. I'd do single sets of 200 push-ups for three sets, then I'd go on to do archer push-ups, slow motion quasi-isometric push-ups after that. I did a lot for my biceps and my abs as well, but 
The pecs got by far the most attention. I'm not saying this was a balanced program. I've always had overdeveloped pecs compared to the rest of my body. My point is that this kind of training clearly gave me some kind of advantage, specifically in that area. So I truly believe that this kind of training really works. So what is going on here? Now I'm back at my garden. We're gonna try and work out a bit like a prisoner and see what's going on here. Because I think the key lies in the way that they perform these super high repetition but simple calisthenics movements. So were I trying to do a push-up the way is commonly taught by calisthenics athletes, the proper way, I'd get into a position like this with my hands quite narrow and I would lower myself in a controlled manner until my chest or nose touched the floor. I'd push myself up completely and then I'd push through my scapula here in order to really get that full range of motion. Problem is here, my pecs are getting a rest. Essentially, they're not doing any work, they're resting on my joints and the scapula. Conversely, what a prisoner workout push-up might look like. Slightly wider grip, and then you just perform them like this. No control, no range of motion, just bouncing. And this looks bad on surface, but if you look a bit deeper, it has its own unique benefits. Neither superior, but I do think you should use both together. This is certainly how I started out with my push-ups when I began training in my room. So what's happening here is you're maintaining a contraction. This is continuous time under tension. So basically if you perform a push-up slowly and lock your elbows out, then this gives you a small opportunity to rest, your pecs to rest. Conversely, if you maintain that time under tension by continuously pushing up within that shorter range of motion, then you don't have that opportunity. As such, your pecs are constantly contracting and you limit venous return. In other words, blood begins to build up and pool inside the muscle. This can create all sorts of things via hypoxia, which might be a great trigger for hypertrophy. This is why occlusion training is such an effective way to build big muscle, even using lighter weights. It works in a very similar manner. But at the same time, you might also create more angiogenesis. This is the formation of new blood vessels supplying the muscles with blood and oxygen and nutrients, but also shuttling away waste products that can lead to burnout and failure. In other words, you're increasing your strength endurance, but also increasing your blood supply to the muscles. This makes sense because if you're making it harder for blood to get in and out of the muscles, then obviously the body might adapt by making it easier for blood to get in and out of the muscles. Also means you're gonna get a metabolic buildup, create more metabolic stress, creating that burn sensation, creating that pump that can also lead to a form of hypertrophy. It's one of the three major contributors to hypertrophy that we know of, alongside muscle damage and mechanical tension. This also means that you'll be able to perform repetitions for longer, which is why when you practice this, you'll get better and better at doing bigger and bigger rep ranges of push-ups or whatever exercise it is you've chosen. But at the same time, it also means that afterwards, you've got a greater blood supply, a greater supply of nutrients to the muscle, which in turn can help to improve recovery and growth. So this might aid with hypertrophy in a biphasic manner so that you train and then you recover and you grow the muscles bigger, quicker afterwards. At the same time, there's a correlation between increased blood supply to the muscles and increased myonuclei, increased satellite cells and increased protein synthesis. It seems you might be able to create more myonuclei by donating satellite cells, which in turn creates more opportunity for protein synthesis to occur. This isn't shown precisely in the studies. What I'm doing here is connecting the dots, but we know that occlusion training can increase angiogenesis. We know that continuous time under tension can work like occlusion training. We know occlusion training results in greater hypertrophy, and we know there's a connection between increased blood supply to the muscle and increased satellite cells and myonuclei. So if we add it all up and if we look at all these examples, it seems very likely that something like this is going on here. The myonuclei stick around for the long term, as far as we know, and so too might those increased blood vessels. This might mean that you actually can build muscle more easily or regain lost muscle more easily and even maintain muscle more easily. So this form of training could have long-term implications for the rest of your training. If you go through a long period of training like this early on in your fitness career then you might reap the benefits for years and decades afterwards and I think that's something that's fortunately happened to me by pure accident and has happened to many other athletes and trainees as well. Increasing blood supply might also help to strengthen the tendons because the tendons generally have a lower blood supply versus muscle which makes them slower to adapt to training and slower to recover from injury but by creating more blood supply we might be able to overcome some of these issues. Beyond this, this kind of training, these extremely high rep ranges could also create positive neurological adaptations. That's because we're rehearsing the movement so many times. As Pavel Satsulin says, strength is a skill. In other words, the movements you perform, whether it's a bench press or a deadlift, these are skills in themselves that require rote repetition to learn. This is especially true for a lot of advanced calisthenics movements. 
The same is true for a push-up. If you want to get better at push-ups, you just practice doing push-ups, ignoring all that stuff like muscle damage. If you're doing hundreds and hundreds of push-ups every single day or multiple times per week, then of course this is gonna result in you becoming better at push-ups. And what it might also do is transfer over to some other skills like bench press. Because what you're essentially doing here is training intramuscular coordination. You're teaching yourself to better recruit the muscle fibers, the motor units that you need to perform that movement. You're getting better at pushing, and you only have to adapt that a little bit to apply it to a bench press or something else like that. This could go deeper still when it comes to reaching failure because those people who go to these extremely high rep ranges are often doing it to failure. You might even find some ways to go past failure by dropping to your knees and continuing to do the push-ups. What happens here is that you've fatigued and utilized all of the motor units, all of the muscle fibers that you can in order to perform those repetitions. But if you try and push through, if you try and perform extra reps, even at this point of failure, what you're doing is you're teaching your central nervous system to recruit more motor units, more muscle fibers when it needs it to go beyond its maximum. And then when you perform a one rep max later on at the gym, potentially, you can recruit more motor units to perform that one rep max slightly easier. You've essentially just increased that signal so that you can shout to the muscles louder to produce force. And the way we're performing this is essentially almost like a plyometric. We're performing these bobbing push-ups, as you see. What I'm doing is I'm going down to the bottom of the movement and bouncing back up. The strength curve has changed. This is a negative in some ways, but it's also a positive because it means that I'm developing power from that lower position. This then translates to the kind of bouncy performance. You guys have seen me do my kind of bouncing, handspringy push-up sequences before. That comes from doing this kind of training. It's made my pecs really explosive and by increasing your rate of force production and your explosiveness, this might transfer more to punches and things, but even some of the big lifts where being able to generate that massive amount of force in order to then carry the weight through the range of motion can be really useful especially if you're like bouncing the weight off your chest with a vest, etc. So yeah, in short, you might think that performing these kind of cheat versions of push-ups is a bad thing, and in some ways it is, but at the same time, it might just be the secret to the incredible strength and performance we see in some prisoners. Now, I don't want to make any sweeping statements. Some of these things are based on myth and rumor, and you know, who knows what else they actually got up to in those jail cells. But the point is, there seems to be some kind of benefit to doing super, super high rep calisthenics. And all these ideas, I think, explain why that might be. And also gels, it also makes sense with my own personal experience. I would say don't exclusively train this way because it's not a full package in terms of performance. Whilst you'll build explosiveness and strength and size, you're not gonna have that full control you'd get by properly going through the range of motion, the full range of motion. At the same time, there's only certain body parts we can train this way. So what I recommend is that within the same workout, you combine extremely high rep push-ups, extremely high rep squats, and you put this with much fuller range, more controlled, slower versions of those exercises. Maybe even quasi-isometrics, where you take a whole minute to perform a single repetition. This is again something I actually did intuitively as a kid. I called it time division. Similarly, I would say that there's no reason to necessarily do 200, 300 repetitions. What you can do instead is to do a few repetitions of a harder variation and then to do lots and lots of lighter, faster repetitions. Likewise, you might decide to do some heavy dips and then perform lots and lots of push-ups or some weighted push-ups and then push-ups. You're not actually in a prison, so you can do these things. And this will just get you to that point of failure much quicker while still training those same things. I actually build this right into my super functional training program 2.0, the protein performance system, by using what I call gauntlet sets, where you start on the hardest variation of an exercise and end on the easiest, but with higher rep ranges to fill out a total count. If you're interested in that, you'll get most of these benefits and that's why I've designed it that way. There's a link in the description down below. It comes with over two hours of instructional video and an 80 plus page ebook. It's also important that when you do these high, high rep exercises, you are sticking to closed chain movements. That means that you have your hands and legs on solid ground. At the same time, they should be stable movements. You don't wanna be doing high, high repetitions of pistol squats, for example, because that requires a balance component, a mobility component, and it's just a recipe for injuring yourself. This is something we see with CrossFit. What they're doing here is this kind of high rep work against resistance, which I think is really, really good, but because they're using movements that are a little bit more dangerous, some Olympic lifts, for example, that's where we start to see the accidents. So this works, you just need to do it using the right kind of exercise. Hindu squats, arguably, because you're on the balls of your toes, are not that stable. For me personally, it's not something that I have much of an issue with, but your mileage may vary, so ease into this stuff. Likewise, especially if you've got weak knees. Finally, I will also say that these workouts, these prisoner workouts, are gonna lead to some imbalances, and they're not very complete, because if you're training with just your body weight, especially if you're just following the classic, like, sit-ups, pull-ups, press-ups routine that seems to come straight from One Punch Man, 
what you want to do is throw in some rotations, some movement in the transverse plane, and you can do that with a kettlebell by doing swings. Otherwise, you're going to have to do kick-throughs with high repetitions, which is tiring, but can be really good. Now, I wouldn't say I have a lot of experience when it comes to hashtag prison life, but I do know that if you're going to survive, you need a posse. Fortunately, I had the best cellmate in the world, Kel. You might remember him as my son from a previous video. He's all out of nappies now and doing crimes with his pa. I've actually been training with him like this ever since then. I think he reminds me of a coconut called Charl from a different YouTube channel. And if you can name me that YouTube channel, then kudos for having great taste in YouTube channels. Likewise, you really want to pick something up off the ground and strengthen your hip hinge and your lower back. And a great way to do that is with kettlebell swings. A great one for the shoulders is the kettlebell halo. So what I'm basically saying is that by just adding a kettlebell, which is technically cheating if we're in prison, but we're not in prison, unless you are in prison, in which case, soz. If you're not in prison, then you can add a kettlebell to your routine. It's a little bit cheating, spending the rules, but it's gonna give you those other options. And I do think it has the kind of, you know, prisoner appeal. It's a kind of grungy piece of equipment. I don't know what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's how you can start applying these principles. And that's why I think the prisoner workout is such a powerful, modality and one that we all could incorporate, especially by combining with others like maximum strength training, cardio and advanced calisthenic skills. We do this together, I think you're gonna see amazing results. So there it is, that's what I think is the secret to prisoner workouts and just to high repetition calisthenics, body weight training in general. I think it's a powerful, powerful tool that's overlooked by a lot of the fitness community. Let me know in the comments down below what you think, do you agree with me? Head over to Patreon if you'd like to support the channel and get access to the exclusive Discord server if you're in the highest tier. There we talk about all things related to human performance, productivity, training, brain training, etc. And for the top two tiers, I've just added a behind the scenes look at the making of this video where I talk about the filming process and how I fitted it into my day around my training, my eating schedule, etc. If you'd like to check that out, then yeah, put the link in the description down below. Either way, thank you so much for watching this one, guys, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. So this has hopefully been a bit of fun and maybe quite interesting and useful, but it's no laughing matter if you are in jail. And if you are in jail, then something great you can do is to build a website with Squarespace, today's sponsor. It's a great way to keep yourself busy when you're trapped in a small room and a great way to stay in touch with the outside world. I don't even know if this is allowed, by the way, but it seemed like a sensible segue. Either way, Squarespace is a website building platform and tool that makes it extremely easy for anyone to build a website. And I'm talking in a matter of minutes. You might think that's an exaggeration when you hear people say it, but it's actually really that simple. You can have a professional looking website that quickly, that easily. Thanks to their fluid engine, you can just drag and drop elements into the design making it easier than ever to really quickly mock up your website. You can work from existing templates to get ideas and to streamline the process and then edit them to your heart's content. It has all the features you could possibly want, gated members only content, for example, appointment scheduling, e-commerce features, social media integration, advanced formatting, literally anything you could want. And you can expand this even further with third party plugins, adding things like inventory management to your e-commerce suite or global shipping and tracking. Whatever the case, Squarespace has you covered. So if you'd like to check it out, head over to squarespace.com. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Bioneer and you'll get 10% off of your first domain or website. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Thanks to you guys. And bye for now.